find a seat, get cozy. Uh, I'm Kristen, for those of you that have not seen my face before on the internet or in real life. Um, we have also got Emily Eliza Moyer here. I'm pointing at my screen where I see her. She's wearing the power hoops. She's waving, yep. And then Gina and Kelly from A Sweat Life are here too. Um, we are going to give it about another minute or so for people to wander into our room. Um, but in the meantime, I would love to use the chat feature. So say hi, if, if you know how to use the chat feature. I'm gonna test it out right now. I'm, I'm new to Zoom. Ah, great, I have a friend. Cool. Oh, Ellen, eating dinner? How could you? It's okay, I've got a drink. Cheers. I'm gonna go get a drink. It's a great idea. Good, good, good. Um, I am in Indiana currently, but I hear that it was like almost 80 degrees in Chicago today. So I'm happy. It, it was a nice day here too, but I think it hit like 75, not quite 80. So I'm happy for all of us. We deserve this. Who went outside today? Who got some of the, the summer weather? I think I'm a little bit like pink on my cheeks and my nose. <laughs> the first tan of the year. 84. Oh, and Ellen, you're in Florida? That's awesome. Good for you. The heat is in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll give it another little bit um, and then we will officially kick things off. Um, feel free to use the chat feature at any time if you have like questions that you want Emily or me to answer at the end. Um, if there's any technical difficulties, feel free to chat. Kelly is going to be running uh, IT support for all of us because uh, she is the, the most senior Zoom leader in our organization. So we're, we're going to let her flex a little bit. All right. Cool. Um, let's go ahead and kick things off then. Hi guys, uh, like I said at the, the top of this, I'm Kristen. I'm the editor-in-chief of A Sweat Life. Um, currently, again, in Indiana with my puppy and three other members of my household uh, sheltering in place from a, from a distance. So um, I am so excited to be hosting this. I've done this once before in the fall with a resume workshop, but this time it's gonna be different and more exciting because I'm bringing in Emily. Uh, Emily, why don't why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll do the typical A Sweat Life kickoff and then we'll get started. Perfect. Hi guys, I'm Emily. Um, I'm so excited to be here and to do this workshop with all of you. Uh, I'm a career strategist and a leadership coach. Um, so all the work that I do is focused on helping people build careers they absolutely love. I sort of don't buy into the idea that work is just work. Um, and so I, I help people craft plans and master leadership skills so they can, they can really step into their fullest potential and really just love, love their work. Um, I like to say I sort of, I help people dream um, and really get what they want out of life. So um, I, I'm also bringing a little bit of experience from the hiring manager standpoint here. So I'm the former head of sales and marketing for a venture-backed travel startup called Remote Ear. Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, it's a company that, that takes remote professionals or took remote professionals on trips around the world for a year. Um, but I got to grow both the sales and a marketing team from the ground up during my time at Remote Ear, meaning I was hiring constantly and interviewed hundreds of, of candidates for positions. And so I get to kind of bring both the perspective of somebody who's both landed a dream job multiple times and has, has uh, hired tens and tens of people and then interviewed hundreds of people. Um, and so, yeah, super excited to be here with you. Um, and I guess just a quick plug, I've been hosting Office Hours kicked off this week just for a sweat life. Uh, ambassadors. They're on Mondays and, and I believe the information's been sent out. So if you if you do want some additional one-on-one -on -one support, um, feel free to, or not one-on-one, -on -one, but some additional more hands-on support, feel free to, to uh, pop into office hours. And we'll make sure, um, we'll send out a thank you email after this and I'll make sure to include that information in it as well um, if you're not taking notes. Uh, awesome. Well, thank you. Um, so if you guys have not been to an IRL, uh, a sweat life workshop or workout before 
one thing we always do is ask people um, to try new things and to make new friends. And obviously that looks a little bit different right now uh, while we are socially distancing and becoming Zoom experts all over here. So I do still wanna kind of get to know everyone and have a little icebreaker. So um, we are going to just answer a quick question in the chat. And I want to know what is the most interesting job you have ever held? The weirdest job, what is something that you've been paid to do that maybe uh, not everyone else has? Um, Emily, have you had any weird jobs? Totally. Let me think about it though for a second. Um, yes. Yes, that looks good. My first job in high school, I, it's actually cool, but weird. I taught cooking classes at a gourmet like cooking shop. So I got to like literally like teach both like adults how to like saute things and how to use knives and kids Ooh. how to make like those dirt cups. Um, oh. That was one of my first jobs. And my boss from that job still like pings me on LinkedIn and follows what I do. It was my high school job. That is so cute. Um, <laughs> as soon as I asked that question, oh, good. I'm reading from Gina. Perfect. Because I didn't have a good one. Gina had a job in a children's clothing show. Oh, I've heard of this before. Yes. 2008 jobs. Jobs were like they are now. Um, may we all be so lucky to work in a children's clothing showroom at some point in our lives. Oh, Ben and Jerry scooper. I love it. Wow. You guys are cool. All of my jobs, like I started off just being like a hostess in a restaurant and waitressing, um, which that job itself isn't exciting, but the restaurant that I worked at was like a super hippie, vegan, crunchy restaurant. And so you got some weird characters. And I remember one time someone came in with their pet parrot on their shoulder and they just ate brunch with their parrot. Um, ordered a little bit of toast for him. So nice. Awesome. I am going to look forward to scrolling through these later on. Um, what I'm going to do now is to pull up the, the presentation that Emily and I have worked so, so hard on. Um, keep going, guys. Cool. All right. Perfect. Loading, loading. Awesome. Can everyone see that? Emily and Gina, give me a thumbs up. Yeah. Cool. All right. That means I know how to technology. Awesome. So as you guys know, when we signed up for this, uh, Emily and I are here to help you write a resume that lands you the interview and then hopefully eventually the job. Um, so here's a little bit about what we are going to look over today. We're going to talk about what your resume should do, what it shouldn't do, then sort of go through the building blocks of your resume. Um, examples. Emily was nice enough to send out um, her uh, a PDF of her resume, which was in your all's thank you email. Um, Emily, if you could, would you shoot a link of that into the group chat? That would be awesome. Um, that way everyone can pull it up just so they can reference it throughout. Um, and then we'll have time at the end for a Q&A. So if you guys have questions, feel free to shoot them in the comments whenever and we will answer them at the end. All right. So what should your resume do? Um, what I like to do is to think of your resume as a marketing tool, right? It is showing what you've achieved and how you've advanced uh, throughout your work history. So it's not just a by the book listing of every single job you've ever held. It's a marketing document. It's highlighting everything that you've accomplished. So your resume is not just a chronological timeline of what jobs you've held. It's marketing you and branding you as someone that this, these people want to hire. Um, Emily, do you want to talk through this since this was your um, acronym, the B-Rayer? Yeah, so Kristen's going to go super in-depth as to like every section of the resume. Um, she's going to really speak to each of these points, but we kind of wanted a way to just give a framework to everybody for the most important pieces. I'm a former teacher, so I always have to sort of have like the key points or the key takeaways. Um, and specifically around resumes, if you walk away with nothing else, we think that this is sort of the stuff that encompasses everything else that we're going to talk about in terms of resumes. So screenshot this on your computers and refer back to this piece. Um, but results first. So this idea is um, that your resume should really show the results of your work. 
Um, if you, this looks very different for different jobs, different roles. If at any point you're not really sure how to show results, feel free to just drop a question with um, a little bit more specifics about what your type of work is and we can help you brainstorm and get creative on how to show results. But ultimately that might be a portfolio, that might be quantitative numbers, but if you can somehow demonstrate results, super, um, that's the thing that hiring, hiring managers are looking for first. Um, active verbs. <coughs> Excuse me. This idea is that, you know, there's, as Kristen said, like this is your way to market yourself and to tell your stories. So you want to make it interesting. Um, and the best way to make that story interesting is to create um, sort of excitement throughout your resume. Um, and so you want to choose verbs that actually really demonstrate the work that you did. Um, so we probably won't go too in depth here, but, um, but it, the best tip I can give you is as soon as you write your resume, go back and just do an edit just for the ver verbs. Look at all the verbs and see if you can replace any of them with um, some that are a little bit more descriptive and a little bit more engaging for your audience or the hiring manager. So we're talking like the is, are, was type of verbs, right? Like be verbs there. Yeah. So instead of saying like, I was the manager of a blah, 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 or I was the, you know, content creator, blah, 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 um, you want to flip that and say something like managed team of 26 people or hired, mm -hmm. led, onboarded a team of 26 people. Um, so that's sort of like a, a little example of that quick flip. Um, relevant experience. So you don't have to put everything that you've ever done on your resume. What I have, what I actually showed you guys is specifically tailored to jobs that before I built my business, I was looking for coaching jobs. So that resume is actually specifically tailored to show all of the ways in which I coached people. Some of those roles I'd never actually put on a resume before because they hadn't been relevant. So what you want to really think about is how are you telling your story and really only including the relevant experience that helps the, uh, the hiring manager see that your experience is actually exactly what they're looking for in terms of filling that role. And then finally, easy to read. So I'll actually say mine's not perfect for this. Like mine probably has way too much information on it. Like if I were actually gonna kind of go back and look at that, I'd probably pull some off. But, um, but I think with the, the thing that it, is is it there's no distractions there's no color if you are applying for creative roles you can get a little bit more creative but if you're applying for standard jobs like you actually just don't need to get super creative with what your resume looks like it's information it's a story you want your hiring manager to be able to look at it in 30 seconds and get the information that they need they're not going to be reading it line by line so just make sure that they're actually it's organized in a way that they can get the information that they need awesome thank you um, perfect. So that is what your resume should do. And then on the back end, what your resume should not do. And you'll hear us kind of flipping around what we just said, but we're hammering it home. Um, first of all, your resume should not list every single accomplishment that you've had since you were 13. Um, we don't need to know your high school GPA. We probably don't need to know your college GPA. We don't need to know about that first job um, as interesting as it was or how compelling the children's clothing store might be. Um, we want to care more about what's relevant and what makes you the best fit for this specific position that you're applying for. Uh, another thing your resume should not do is not be long form prose. And I will be the first to admit that I like to write. I like to have fun with like how I describe what I'm doing and what I've accomplished. Um, and there is a time and a place for that and a resume is not necessarily that. So uh, if you catch yourself getting a little bit too wordy, um, full paragraphs on your resume, it's time to reel it back in uh, and make sure that the sentences are a little shorter, a little punchier, and again, leaning really heavily on those active verbs. Um, other things that you should be aware of not including in your resume, uh, anything that's inappropriate or off topic, um, we don't need to know your height, your weight, Uh, uh, your marital status, kids, any random hobby is probably thinking, I'll include that, but it, it happens. I'm sure hiring managers have seen that before. Um, no need to put what astrological sign or what type Enneagram you are on your resume. Uh, that will come later, if at all. Uh, and then finally, your resume should not try to be too cute. And unfortunately, Elle Woods was a, a one-off exception for that. She's the only one who can get away with a pink scented resume for that little extra something. All right, so now we're gonna go into sort of building your resume from top to bottom. 
Uh, and one thing that I do want to mention, this might look different. We're covering like very basic job searching resumes. Uh, if you're in academia and you have a CV, that's going to follow a whole set different set of guidelines. And if you're in a more creative or more technical field where an online portfolio or a, a, like a physical portfolio might be a little more relevant to showcase your abilities and your skills, um, that's also going to look a little bit different. So this is for the standard resume. All right. And again, if you want to pull up that example, now's a good time uh, so you can use it to reference as we go through these different building blocks. So starting off at the top, uh, we're gonna keep it pretty simple. Uh, your contact information and your basic info. So name, address, cell phone number, email, all that good stuff goes right at the top so that your hiring manager knows immediately where you are. Um, if you want to level this up a little bit, you can add a professional website or a portfolio if you have one that you've kept up to date. Social media handles, that is also possibly interesting to include, I would add in the caveat that that should only happen if you have a professional social media pr presence. So if you use Twitter frequently for um, sharing articles that you've written on LinkedIn, or if you engage in different discussions, um, commenting on like different industry news via the social media, um, that's when it would make sense to include that handle on your resume. Uh, only include it if you really want that hiring manager to look at it and be impressed with the work and the, the connections that you've made. Um, you can also add in like clickable hyperlinks if you have like articles that you want to reference or if again if you want to add in that website or an online presence portfolio you can do that in a PDF and make those hyperlinks clickable. Um, you could also include a link to your LinkedIn using that. Uh, question that we are going to get into a little bit more later. I know Emily has a uh, a friend who is definitely good at this is, how do I make my resume look professionally designed? Um, first of all, know that that's not necessary. Just like Emily said, you want your resume to tell the story, to kind of stand for itself. It doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to have colors and uh, unique fonts. But if you do want to make it a little bit different, um, I myself have used Etsy as a template for a resume. Um, you can buy the files for like five bucks and then you customize them for yourself. So I recommend that. Google Docs also has a bunch of templates that you can use, uh, a friend who's in a creative field. But again, unless you are in that creative field where the visual storytelling really matters, don't need to worry about this too much. You can keep it pretty simple. All right, after that, we are going to go into our work history. Uh, starting with the basics, we are going to list any of those um, jobs that you've held that make you a stronger candidate for this specific position. Um, so for me, my first job was babysitting at age 13. Don't need to include that on a resume. They don't need to call up Mr. and Mrs. Miller and hear about how great I was at wrangling their kids for a few hours. Um, on the other hand, another job might have been waiting tables during college and maybe during that time I got promoted to manager and I jumped in to help with marketing. I learned the ropes of digital marketing um, while I was still doing that waitress job at that same restaurant. That could be relevant if it shows how it relates to the position that you're applying for. So um, another FAQ here that we see is, should I list every job I've ever had? That's gonna get really long. Nope, don't do it. Remember uh, that R in the rare um, acronym that Emily shared, we want it to be relevant. So your resume is a marketing document and it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, you wanna highlight the roles that make you more attractive to the company that you want to get hired by. So skip listing jobs that don't fit into that story or that narrative that you're trying to tell. Um, you can also feel fine to skip jobs um, on your work history that you were only at for a few months. Um, I was at a startup for four months one time and I leave that off my resume because it's not relevant to the jobs that I'm trying to apply for now. Um, you don't have to include any part-time roles that you've done as a side hustle. You can even leave off a job that you got fired for. Um, so know that you are the author of your own story here and you don't have to include every single thing. All right, things to avoid um, in terms of your work history specifics. Um, this goes into a lot of those active verbs that Emily talked about earlier. So avoiding naming things like, um, I maintained the company website, head of diversity committee, just that. Um, or this super wordy example uh, that I don't even want to spend time reading aloud, even though I wrote it, because that's a lot of lines of text. Um, so those are a couple of things to avoid. Instead, 
we're looking for those results. We're looking for that um, advancement throughout your company and we're looking for those action verbs. So grew website traffic 40% by building a company blog and implementing SEO best practices. This is a great one because it shows that number. It shows a tangible result that people can understand really easily. Um, and it also shows how you did it. So not just that you did it, but the path that you took to get there. Um, if you were the head of the diversity committee, you did that by leading quarterly town hall meetings, facilitating discussions, et cetera. So that goes into a little more detail about what that position actually entailed. Uh, increased social media following by 55%, similar to the, the first one in terms of showing numbers and showing your specific strategy. Um, one thing that we also want to make sure you guys hear from this slide is that you want to show advancement. Um, Emily, do you want to touch on this a little bit? I know this was your, your suggestion. Yeah, so um, relevant work history is obviously what, what we've been sort of focusing on here, but a really big thing that we just wanted to make sure to call out is advancement. So hiring managers want to see that you got promoted. Promoted doesn't necessarily have to be you got a new title. If you did get multiple titles, I would definitely recommend making sure you include what those multiple titles were, especially if responsibilities increased um, or, or sort of changed as the role changed. Um, but more importantly, what they want to see is that you got more responsibility over time because what that meant is that you were excelling, you were a high performer, so that your, your manager, your previous company was trusting you enough to take on more responsibility. So I'd say the two things that hiring managers are really looking for is, do they have relevant experience that's gonna tell me that they can do this role? And are they a high performer? Are they gonna do a good job at the role? Um, so that's what advancement really shows is that they're, they're gonna be able to, they're gonna not just be able to do a good job at it, but that they're gonna be able to continuously take on more responsibility. Perfect, A plus. Um, okay, so. One question that you might be thinking is like, well, my job isn't particularly easy to show results in, right? Um, maybe it's a little more fuzzy than that. It's a little more qualitative than quantitative. Um, in that case, you want to ask yourself this question. You wanna ask, what did you accomplish in this job that nobody else could have? Um, so a couple of examples of a qualitative result that you might wanna show. Uh, maybe you covered for a coworker who was on extended leave by taking on additional responsibilities or developing skills outside of your job description for a certain amount of time. Um, maybe that there was a new company software that you saw a need for, so you uh, pitched your team on why it needed to be included in your all's processes. You were the one who learned how to use it, who onboarded everybody else. You did the training. That would be a great qualitative thing for you guys to show. Um, even something as fuzzy as like having good relationships with your clients can be talked about. Um, if you are a total people person, you work in a client facing industry, you can point to that um, and use that as a jumping off point for what you'll talk about in, the, in your interview um, about how good you were about with dealing with clients. Uh, the only thing that I would suggest here too is that you want to try to avoid subjective descriptions. Um, and we'll talk about that a little more later on. Oops, come here. All right, education next. Um, nice and simple. You really just need to include what school you went to, your degree, and then any special focuses or concentrations that you took on. Um, for me, I went to uh, undergraduate at a college called Transylvania University, uh, and then I went to Matt Graduate School at DePaul. And at DePaul, I got my degree in professional writing with a tech, with a specialty in like technical writing. So I always included that when I was applying to like more technical copywriting jobs um, right out of college. Um, question you guys might have, should I include my GPA? What about different clubs and organizations I was a part of? Uh, you probably don't need to do this unless you are right out of college searching for an entry level job. Uh, things like a fraternity and sorority, I would advise against including on your resume. Uh, clubs and organizations, maybe only if they were relevant to the type of job that you are applying for um, and if they're like in a professional sort of sense. So like maybe the future doctors club or, you know, something to do with the law review at your college uh, newspaper, if you're in the journalism route, think about that. Um, and also, I would only really include these if you had a leadership role as well. So you're showing um, that you can grow something, just as Emily was saying early on. Um, one more thing, this might not be relevant to you, but you don't have to include the years that you were in school. Um, companies aren't allowed to discriminate against you based on age. So if you 
don't want to include when year you graduated from college, you do not have to. Fun fact. All right, going on to the skills section of your resume. Um, in a lot of fields, your skills should be evident from your work experience section, uh, but some really technical fields might be the exception, or if you're in another creative field where you need to show specific like skill sets like Photoshop or Lightroom or something like that. Um, personally, I would think about how you want to allocate your real estate on your resume. Um, resumes can get crowded really fast because you have a lot of accomplishments um, and you probably want to highlight other things above these skills. So keep it in mind that this can be an optional thing. Um, what you want to avoid in this section is subjective traits that don't show. Um, so great leadership skills, strong written communication, works well with others. Those are all pretty um, self-judged, right? Like I could say I am a strong strong written communicator, but who's to know? Um, so instead, you want to show those objective actions that highlight these traits. Uh, and ideally, you would probably do that in your work experience. So uh, instead of great leadership skills, maybe you would say party planning committee chair, and then what that detailed. Um, instead of strong written communication, wrote LinkedIn articles monthly for the company page, works well with others, uh, transforms into received the best team player award. Um, and again, the exception to this would be if you have hard skills and certifications that are important to the job that you're applying for. So if you're applying for a job in digital marketing, it would be helpful to show that you are certified in Google Analytics or HubSpot or something like that. If you're applying to you know, a design job, you wanna show um, that you're skilled in Photoshop, InDesign and Lightroom. And especially if that job that you're applying for in that description, if they say, we want someone who is proficient in this specific software, then you would want to put that in your skills section for sure. All right, and then moving on, um, a profile or like an objective. Um, and again, this is another optional one. Um, so this might not be the right fit for you, but if you do choose to include this, this is what you would call like your elevator pitch. Um, and I've put it right at the top of my resume before. You can take a look at that. It's just about three sentences, 20 seconds worth of words that sort of outline who you are as a person and what you are searching for, what um, your, your strengths are and like what you could bring to the position. So it's a little bit more of a storytelling here. Um, yeah, so telling who you are, what you're good at and what you're looking for in this next role. Um, and again, all depends on how you want to spend your real estate uh, on this resume. So uh, one thing that you also might be thinking now, especially as we get into the meat of this program is maybe your resume is super outdated. Um, how do I begin to remember what you've accomplished uh, to update it? So a couple of things here. Um, if we're in the immediate, if your resume feels super outdated and you're like, I have no idea what I've done, I would reach out to current managers, to team members um, and ask them like, what has stood out about your experience in working with me? Do you remember a time where I sort of took on a project or a leadership role? Ask people for help because I know um, it's really easy to forget like awesome things you've done even when you're successful. Um, and in the meantime, what you should do today is start what I like to call a ta-da list. Um, and this is an ongoing list of your accomplishments. Um, ideally, you would res update your resume like every six months or so, but we're all human. We, we probably will not do that when all is said and done. Um, so instead, what I like to do is keep a running list of everything that I would like ta-da for uh, anything that I'm proud of. Um, and so anytime a project wraps up or you get good results, just make a little note of this in this Google Doc or on a sheet of paper on your desk, wherever you will see it and remember to update it frequently. Um, another tip that I would have would be to create an email folder. Um, I, I call mine bragging, which is very humble and I'm sure totally appropriate. Um, but anytime you get praise from a manager or a partner or a coworker, shuffle it into that folder so that you've got those like t tangible things to look back on. Um, and this can also be especially helpful when you are ready for that advancement, when you're looking up for that promotion. Um, and then my last tip for you guys would be to keep your LinkedIn up to date. Uh, I don't know why, but for some reason, the idea of updating my LinkedIn is a lot less daunting than the idea of like opening a Word doc. I don't know, for some reason that sounds really hard sometimes. So keep your LinkedIn up to date um, pay it forward by giving recommendations to people that you work with um, and hopefully they'll pay that back and so keep that fresh and keep that exciting for prospective uh, hiring managers to look at. 
Um, yeah, perfect. Okay, we're crushing it. Other odds and ends. Um, should I include hobbies, extracurriculars, volunteer work, if I speak different languages? Um, the, the answer for this by and large is gonna be probably not. Um, hobbies probably would not recommend including that on your resume. You've got more important things to brag about. Extracurriculars, again, probably not. Volunteer work, only if it's significant and only if it included skills that would be relevant to the job that you're applying for. So maybe you work for PAWS and you help coordinate volunteer outreach and you're applying for a position at a nonprofit where you would be doing something similar, then it would make sense. Otherwise, um, if it was just like four hours a month walking dogs, probably not. Although I'm jealous of you because that's a great volunteer gig. Um, languages, include it if you're fluent, um, if it would help in the terms of the job that you are applying for, if that's part of the role or like just a nice to have, if you know that you're applying for a job where, you know, a lot of the vendors speak primarily another language, by all means, go ahead and include it. But um, high school Spanish need not be included on your resume. Uh, all right, my other FAQ, do I really need a new resume for every single job I apply for? I'm sorry, yeah, you do. <laughs> you do need a different resume. Um, and I know, that it's a pain. I know it's annoying to tweak your resume, especially if you're in an aggressive job search. Um, it can be really hard to manage and hard to think about how you need to make this resume slightly different from the other ones. So my suggestion would be to save what you, what I call a like base resume. So this is like my full like four page document where it's got all of my jobs, all of my work history, all of my um, like specifics and like leadership roles, all of that. It's like my encyclopedia. And when it's time to apply for a new job, I resave it with the name of the job that I'm applying for and then start to cut from there. Um, for me personally, I find that whenever I'm editing something, it's easier to cut than to add. And then from there you can tweak. So um, again, my suggestion would be to have a base resume that saves all of your accomplishments, all of your brags, and then it's a little bit easier to winnow down um, to something that fits the specific job that you are applying for. Um, and again, you don't have to do a completely new resume for every single job, but it does need to be tweaked. Uh, you wanna highlight certain accomplishments that are more relevant for one job than the other. Um, so you wanna make it unique. All right, I'm tossing to Emily now. Uh, and I, Emily, if you give me a thumbs up, I'll keep running point on, this, on the presentation. Okay, sounds great. So, Kristen just did an awesome job walking everybody through what your resume should include, what it shouldn't include. Um, we're going to pivot a little bit into, okay, now what do you do with your resume, right? doesn't really do very good if you have this incredible resume, but it just sort of like sits in your desktop and actually doesn't make it out into the world. So that's, that's what we're going to be talking about now, what to actually do with your resume so that you can get your foot in the door and get an interview. Excellent. Like the cat. Like the cat. Yeah. Okay. So I'm getting a lot of questions right now from clients, um, specifically because job hunting during coronavirus um, feels different, right? So if anybody was job hunting back in 2008 during a recession, probably felt similar. Um, but the big question that people are asking is, how do I stand out as a candidate when so many other people are applying for jobs right now? And we're going to talk through exactly how to do that. Um, but the truth is, is it's actually not very different from standing out as a candidate in any other time. Most people don't do anything to stand out. So I guess the only difference is maybe more people are asking the question now, but, but really I think um, there's really such an opportunity for you to stand out just by going a little bit more, just by doing a little bit more than the average person would do. Um, so the first thing I wanted to just kind of touch on is this idea of what your, what your mindset is going into your job hunt. Um, the thing that I see happen a lot is we are sort of traditionally taught that in the job hunting process, you go out, you see what's, what jobs are online, you think about your requirement, or you think about your own experiences and qualifications, you see if you could be a fit, right? You apply the 
employer gets back to you, maybe doesn't get back to you. And then ultimately they get to decide if you're going to move forward. They get to decide how much they're going to pay you. They get to sort of decide everything else. And we sort of give employers all of this power. Um, and the truth is, is you as the employee or you as the job seeker, you actually have so much more power than you give yourself credit for. You are bringing your energy and your talents and your gifts and your strengths. You're giving that time also to an employer that ultimately like that's going to help them run their business. It's going to help them make money. It's going to help them grow. So it's very valuable. So I just always like to sort of give people this sort of reframe of how would it, how would it feel different if you actually approached the job hunting process from a place of, of empowerment and really feeling like you got to kind of go shopping and decide, decide which jobs were going to be the right fit for you rather than who are you the right fit for. So that's that first piece. You have the power. You got the power. <laughs> I was looking for that gift. I couldn't find it. <laughs> um, the second one is don't stand in your own way. Um, I cannot tell you how many people I see who just qualify themselves and they just don't actually apply for jobs because they don't think they have enough experience. They don't think they're the right fit. Um, I will tell you, as a former hiring manager, job descriptions are suggestions. I cannot tell you how many times I hired for a role. I'd never hired for that role before. I copied and pasted what I thought I needed and it changed five times by the time that I actually ended up hiring someone. Or I literally didn't even post a job online and I just like got a referral from from somebody and hired. So don't, if, like, if they say no, like what's the worst that can happen? They say no, right? If you're devastated, you'll, you'll move on, but don't disqualify yourself because you don't think you have the right experience for that specific job. Let them tell you that. And if it's true that you don't have the right experience, great, get that feedback and learn about how you can potentially fill those gaps so that you can get a job like that in the future. And then the last thing is it can be fun. Um, there's just like so much pressure, I think, around getting a new job, especially if you're really stressing out about the income piece. Um, but I just want to like say that it, this is, you're choosing the next thing that is going to be how you spend your time. It's going to be the thing that you spend the majority of your day doing. It's going to be two thirds of your life, right? Like I know that that probably makes it sound really big, but actually like that should be a really exciting thing. I don't mean the word should, but I, I, I mean, it can be a really exciting thing. Um, you know, if we approach our job hunt with a sense of a little lightness and a little fun and a little bit more adventure and exploration and, oh my gosh, I have no idea where this is going to turn out, but like, it could be the coolest thing in the world. And what if I got my dream job through this process, right? It's, it's a way to really just not only enjoy the process more, so you actually get, get more out of it from your angle, but you also are flipping the energy that you're actually sending out into the world. So if you're having fun and you're exploring and you're seeing it as an adventure and an exciting transition into whatever is next, employers are going to feel the same way and they're going to get that, pick that energy back up from you. Um, and this last little note, if you can dream it, you can do it. If you can dream it truly, it's possible for you. So just allow yourself to dream it. Okay. So know what you want. This actually, I think, is probably the toughest thing to do. Um, I, I talk to a lot of people and, and sort of I say, like, well, tell me your dream. Like, what's your dream world? Like, what would your dream job be? And nine times out of 10, the answer I get is, I, I don't know. I actually don't know. Um, and that's okay. Um, but I also don't always believe it because I actually think most people do know what they want, but they don't allow themselves to want what they want. So the first step is allow yourself to want what you want. If you want it, like that's okay. Like that you're allowed to have big dreams. You're allowed to not know how they're gonna happen. And if you really have no idea what you want, I would say spend some time with yourself. Start really, if you don't meditate, meditate. Um, but really tune into your intuition and start really asking yourself some questions about the things that you really loved in previous jobs or previous projects that you took on and really start to dream and create the, a vision for your future. Like what does it look like when you wake up in the morning? How do you spend your time? What types of people do you do you hang out with at work? Um, so really doing some brainstorming for yourself around what types of roles look interesting, what kinds of projects would I potentially want to work on? What types of companies like would I really be excited to give my time and energy to? A lot of people in our generation right now are, are excited about impact-driven companies. Like that's awesome. Like don't limit yourself then. Make sure that you're actually choosing an organization or a company that's 
making the world a better place. Um, and this doesn't have to be, that doesn't have to be a nonprofit. There's lots of for-profit companies that are really serving people in incredible ways. Um, and then the last thing is, so they're sort of taking the dreaming part and making it more tangible now. The riches are in the niches. So um, I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, but it's the uh -huh. idea. <laughs> I like that. It's, it's the idea that um, like, if you're a niche, right? Like that's where the money is. Like the money's in the niches. Um, but ultimately, you know, I think what happens is we try to like almost vanilla ourselves down when we're job hunting. We're like, I'll do anything in marketing, right? Like I'll just, I'm a marketer, I'll do anything because you just want a job. So you think if, if you're broader, then that will attract in the right jobs. But if you think about it, it's sort of like dating. You're not gonna be like, I'm gonna date anybody, like anybody out there, right? Like, no, like there's a few people who would be like the right people for you to date. It's the same thing with jobs. Like you're actually probably not open to just anything. I mean, maybe you would take it if you're in, des if you're in desperation, right? But if you're job hunting and you're being intentional, like there's probably not a thousand options for you. There's probably just a few. And you want those options, those people out there who are looking for you that match, you want them to know that you're the right match for them. So I gave an example here specifically of how that could actually look um, for somebody who is in marketing and how niching down doesn't mean that you're, you're, you're not going to get a job. It just means you're weeding out jobs that are irrelevant and you're making people who are looking for you, that specific niche, you're sort of waving the flag for them to actually be like, oh yeah, you're the person that I want. I'll just pause there for a second. Kristen, anything to add or any, any questions? No, I love that. I think we're, we're talking two, two versions of the same thing. So all awesome. good. Awesome. Um, get the word out. So the idea here is we were sort of talking about this idea of the resume being not only as great as as many eyes see it. Right. So, um, there's, if we think about the traditional way, what happens to a resume, like you apply for a job, you submit your resume, you wait for them to hear back. But actually, if we think about this idea of flipping the whole thing on its head, the whole sort of job hunt process on its head, um, if you are, if you're actually, here we can go back. <laughs> um, if you're taking control, um, then what you really want to do is you, you actually want to almost invite in people to come talk to you who you could potentially be the right fit for. And the best way to really do that is one, email everybody in your network, that niche, that sort of messaging that I just, we sort of talked about just now about knowing what you want, email people and just say, this is, these are the types of roles I'm looking for. Does anybody know anyone who's hiring them? Or these are the types of companies I'm trying to get connected to. Does anybody know anybody at these types of companies? Or, um, or does anybody just do the job that I do and can talk to me about how they got their job? So using your network and literally just emailing and saying, this is what I'm looking for. Here's my resume, but also can you connect me to these specific types of people is a really, really, really great way to get connected to new jobs that could be relevant for you. Um, I have post on social. I don't necessarily mean post your resume on social, but what I mean is post that you're looking, post the types of people that you're trying to get connected to. We have these incredible social networks on our social media now, um, and they're, they're truly effective tools for getting connected to people who could be really, really helpful for you on your career journey. Um, and then Kristen mentioned this, update your LinkedIn, but truly like your LinkedIn is your public resume. Um, it's, your, it's a public professional brand for who you are. And it is a great thing to be able to actually um, share that with the world and also connect with people on LinkedIn who might also be able to help you either get connected to people in the right industry or get connected to other people who are, are hiring specifically for the roles that you're looking at, looking for. Okay, so this is the, um, the thing that I think is interesting for right now because of the world that we live in, which is a completely virtual world, building relationships. Now, normally, if you were looking for a job, you could maybe go to like a professional organization and like go to a networking event or, you know, show up and go to an informational interview or go to job fairs or, or whatever. But obviously, none of those things are options anymore. Um, and I actually think that's a great thing because I don't think those things are even necessarily that effective. Um, I think the best thing you can possibly do is just start building relationships with people who are gonna potentially help you get in front of the right hiring managers, right? Um, and uh, so there's sort of, I have two buckets here. The first is who should you get connected to and then how can you get connected to them? The people that you wanna get connected to are 
hiring managers, first and foremost, the people who are actually potentially hiring for the roles that you want. Other people who work at the company that you want to work at. So if you can't figure out who the hiring manager is, fine. Connect with anybody at the company. They can probably figure out who's hiring and give you that contact information. At the very least, you can just get connected to people at the company and see if the company is even a right fit for you. People in the industry, so specifically, I know like for we're right as well as this wellness world, like there's so many people who want to enter into the wellness world. Well, great. If you want to enter into it, just start building relationships with people who are in the wellness world. Um, you, that will open up so many doors for you. Um, and then finally, this idea of expanders. So if any, anybody sort of has heard this term, it's about um, people doing the job that you want. So if you see somebody doing the exact same thing that you want, just said, reach out to them and ask them, what was your career path? How did you get your job? What advice do you have for me? So those are the types of people I would suggest building relationships with. How do you build relationships with new people? Um, well, first of all, Spot Life's a great network for building, making new friends, right? So this community can, can totally help you. Um, and, and actually, I would recommend like, actually figuring out like, who might be the right people who could potentially make connections for you even within this community. Um, and go connect on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is truly, as I mentioned, like an incredible tool for, for building real connections with people. And you can see where they work and you can see what their jobs are. So um, LinkedIn is a really great place sending people direct messages is a really great way to actually just build build connections um, without having an email address from somebody asking for virtual coffee dates this is like my new favorite thing um, people are craving social interaction and people are craving one-on-one -on -one social interaction people also love talking about their jobs and like they love bragging about like the things that they they do especially if they like their job um, and so I just always recommend just reach out and say hey are you up for a 15 to 20 minute virtual coffee date I'd love to hear a little bit more about the about your job and what you do or about your company or about whatever anything um, and then the last thing I have is flirt with them online. Um, and what I mean by this is engage with them, like be a human, you know, like send something funny, like be you, like there's the, the only way to really build relationships online is to really be as authentic as you possibly can and show your personality. So when I say flirt, I just mean like, don't, you don't need to be so professional. Like you can show your personality and show that you're a human and that's going to be the best way for you to build those relationships. Okay, <laughs> don't we all just love Buzz Lightyear? So cute. Um, go above and beyond. So as I mentioned, like most candidates, most candidates don't do m most of the stuff I just said, period, right? So even just doing a couple of those things, like it's are going to help you move your process along so much faster and, and in a way that's so much more effective in terms of helping you land the job that you want. Um, or even figuring out what you want. Um, but the simplest ways to go above and beyond are, I mean, these few things. Send your resume and your cover letter directly to the hiring manager. If you can get their email address, just send it to them. There's so many ways to get people's email addresses these days. You can, you can literally DIY it. You can make it, I mean, you can send it to five different versions, but see, the best thing you can do is to just get it in front of them. I used to literally have hundreds of hours applicants for my trip for my roles there was no way I could look at all of the resumes but you better believe that if some resume made it across my inbox like and I saw it like that that was they were going to be so much more likely to be considered for the roles um and I these are out of order but follow up so um you know follow-up's huge like there's especially right now everybody's fully digital. Um, don't be afraid to follow up and to follow up a lot. Um, you know, people are, are just bombarded. Hiring managers, usually hiring the position isn't their top priority. They've got a lot of other things to do. Um, and so by following up, you get to just sort of stay top of mind for them. Um, and then the last thing is offering to do a small project for free. I think for a lot of people, you just need a foot in the door. And once you have the foot in the door, you can prove that you are the right candidate. And the best way to do this is by just offering to do a project. Some processes, some hiring processes, like are a little bit more advanced and they actually have projects as a part of the process. Um, some will even pay you to do a project as a part of the hiring process. That's what I used to do. Um, but if they aren't offering that or if that's not a, a, an option or if you aren't getting that interview, just offer that up front and that will be a way to demonstrate that you're serious and that you really, really want to be considered for this role. And some of my sort of favorite little mantras for you to walk away with. Um, first is 
no is just a request for more information. Um, I love this because, I mean, don't take this in terms of like, just take this in the context of job stuff. Um, but um, truly, you know, I think sometimes we take no as like, absolutely not, never. But no could be just not right now or no, but if you get some more experience and X, Y, Z thing, then like we'll consider you. So really don't take no as no forever. Take no as not this moment and use that as an opportunity for you to get some feedback and figure out like, okay, well, tell me more or what else can I share to give you more information to turn that no into a yes. Um, boldness wins. Silence is not no. Again, that follow up. Like if you didn't hear back from somebody, it's not a no. Um, I wouldn't, I would say don't take a no until it's, it's truly, truly a no. Um, and you've heard it very loud and clearly. Um, and ultimately that usually won't come until you've, you've really, you know, followed up. Um, most jobs aren't posted online. This is another huge one. Like the only options, like if you're only looking for jobs that are posted online, you're missing out on so many opportunities. Um, and the only way to really figure out if there are job opportunities at these companies is to actually just talk to people and to connect with hiring managers or team leads or people who are on the team that you're interested in joining. Um, sometimes I'll even create a need if they have somebody that they really want to bring on, even in crazy times like the ones that we have now. And then finally, don't disqualify yourself. Like if there's a job that looks cool, like you've nothing to lose in applying for it. Um, and I think that some of the best jobs I've gotten have been jobs I just applied for, for some other reason than I didn't even really want the job. Like I wanted the interview experience or I wanted whatever to practice. And so, um, you know, at the very least, you know, even if you don't think you really are qualified, but you want to apply, like apply. And then, and then maybe, you know, you'll get lucky and you'll get some feedback and that'll push you forward on your journey closer towards the types of dream jobs that you want. And that's it. So I'll just sort of end with sharing some resources for you guys. Um, my good friend and career coach, another career coach, Kelly Barnard, she's um, this incredible oh. coach that specifically does. Um, oh, I texted you. I didn't know you left. <laughs> <laughs> that um that does hands-on resume linkedin personal branding stuff so she'll like write your resume for you write your linkedin for you like she'll really help you write this stuff so if you're really struggling with like the hands-on actually writing this stuff i definitely recommend reaching out to her um my work is much more sort of high level career strategy as we just talked about um but i've got a lot of exciting things coming up i have another free career workshop tomorrow um and so i just will send out a link to join my email email list and anybody from this workshop who joins will be entered to win a free one-on-one -on -one career strategy session with me if you join the list today. Um, but thank you all so much. And I know we have a lot of questions in the chat, so I'll take a look at those and then, whew. Um, yeah, uh, Emily, if you want to drop a link um, into the chat with your website list, go for it. Yes, let's do it. All right. Um, I have not been keeping up with the chat or the questions. So Emily, I'm going to leave this to you. Sounds good. Okay. So there I'm dropping my link, join my email list there. And then let's look for some questions. So tips for, from Lindy, tips for resume. Oh, hi, Lindy. Tips for resumes when you want to make a career switch and your current job title isn't relevant to the new field. Oh, interesting. So when we think about relevancy, what really matters is the work that you did. So just because your current job, first of all, your job title, you can also play with a little bit. Like I like was the head of brand and content for remote year. I don't say I was the head of brand and content unless that's super relevant. I usually, and I was the head of admissions actually when I was the head of sales. And then I was the head of recruitment. Like we changed the name all the time. Now, when I say, when I talk about what I did, I say I was the head of sales and marketing because like, and that's actually what I did, but we just had like funky creative names. So I will say like, if there is a simpler way to say your title, just say it in a simpler way because the resume reader just wants to be able to like understand what you did. So I would say, keep it as simple, especially if you had like super floofy titles. Mm -hmm. um, if you're, um, if the job's not relevant, but you feel like it's a really, it's a big piece of work experience that you want to include, I would really do your best to figure out how to make your bullet points 
as relevant to whatever the job was, whatever the job requirements and qualifications are. Even if they weren't your like full-time things, like try to tweak those bullets to be as relevant to whatever the job is that you're applying for. So I, I don't know. Yeah. I would also add um, that this is where your cover letter can come in handy, right? Your, your resume doesn't exist in a vacuum. So I would lean on your cover letter heavily to say, you know, as X, Y, and Z at ABC company, I focused on this, which, and here's how it relates to the current job description that I'm applying for. Totally. And I think just for, for what Kristen said, it's like, it's a story, right? Like you're crafting the story of your experience. You need to connect those dots for your employers. So your cover letter is a great way to help connect those dots too. Mm -hmm. Okay. Kim, any suggestions on wording for posting on social that sounds professional and not desperate? You know, I, the thing I've seen the most success in people, and Kristen, I'd be curious to hear what you say too, but um, is people who are looking for something really specific. So rather than saying like, I just got laid off and I'm looking for jobs in marketing, say, I, I'm, I'm looking for connections to people who work in marketing in this industry or, and like tag some specific people. So I, I think it kind of just goes back to knowing what you want and being really, really clear about the types of ways in which people can help you, like make it as easy as possible like it's hard to think, right? Like, okay, well, who do I know in marketing and who do I know that could be potentially relevant? Like make it as easy as possible for people to make those connections for you or to help you out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I will say, I do think, especially now, I think it's okay to show a little bit of vulnerability in your posts. You know, there's a lot of people in um, tricky situations right now when it comes to jobs. And I don't think you have to hide that. I think it's okay to say, you know, I was part of the layoffs recently as part of coronavirus, but I'm excited about this opportunity to further advance my career in this, or maybe to pivot to something that I've always wanted to do. Um, so like, don't be afraid to acknowledge the elephant in the room because you're not alone, um, but make it quick and then focus on like the positive and like what kind of outcome you're hoping for. Totally. Cool. Awesome. Um, what is your advice if you followed up several different times and still haven't received a response? So when, when is kind of your, your cutoff for um, the not hearing back from a hiring manager? It's subjective. Um, I mean, I'd say like, if you haven't heard back from them after like probably four times, like four follow-ups, um, I would probably maybe stop following up, but I, I would say like, is this person getting thousands and thousands of emails? Are they completely overwhelmed? Is there a way that you can connect them on a different platform? Is there a possibility your emails are going to spam? Um, and, and I think on the last follow up, you can just say, you know, it, it sounds like, you know, you can sort of end your follow ups by in a soft way of just saying like, I'm not going to follow up anymore. It sounds like this wasn't a fit. Like, thank you so much for considering my application. And you just sort of, you close the loop rather than just sort of like leaving it like open-ended. Um, and then if they are interested, they'll follow back because they're going to, they're going to know you're not going to follow up anymore. And like you've, you've followed up enough. Um, so yeah, I don't know, Kristen, do you have any thoughts on that one? No, exactly what she said at the end. I've used this strategy myself when I've been doing, when I've done freelance writing in the past, you know, I'll pitch an editor follow up a couple of times. And then um, my last email, I kind of invoke the like fear of missing out clause, I call it. I'll say, hey, you know, I followed up a couple of times and I haven't heard back from you. I understand you're busy. If I don't hear back from you at this point, I'll assume that you're passing on this piece and I'm going to continue to pitch it to other outlets. Um, so, you know, something like that where you're like, okay, if I don't hear back from you, I'm going to move on. I'll assume it's not a fit. Thank you. And please stay in touch if you know, something changes, um, something like that. But I definitely agree that closing the loop um, so that you have the power uh, is, a, is a good way to go. Totally. Uh, last one. Should we do this one from Liz last? Yeah. Any, Any advice? Oops, go sorry, for it. No, I read the last one. You read this one. <laughs> Any advice on structuring your resume if you've been in the same career for a long time? I've been at the same company for 10 years with a number of different positions. Honestly, Liz, I just would tell the story of being at this company for 10 years. I think that's incredible. And I actually think that's pretty rare these days. So I don't, I don't know that there's really anything different that I would do. I would just show 
what your different roles were, the different titles, how your responsibility changed over time. Um, and, uh, and I, and I ultimately would just sort of keep that. Um, yeah. I don't know that there's anything different that I would suggest in terms yeah. of structure. Just keep it simple. Yeah. So I, I think what, what I would do is, um, whereas like under work history, you might give every different company that you've worked out for like its own heading and then bullet points, I would give every position that you've had in that company its own heading and then separate by bullet points, if that makes sense. So that way you really get to get into the nitty gritty of how each position was different, um, how you grew your skill set, how you grew as a manager or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, but that, that slight reformat will make the most sense for your story. Love that. Cool. Um, Emily, remind us where we can find you on the internet. Yeah, so um, Instagram, Emily Eliza Moyer, just my name. Uh, I actually post a ton of like content and tips for people who are, are um, job hunting and looking for um, support on making their next career move. So you can follow me there. Um, and on LinkedIn, please connect with me on LinkedIn. I love connecting with people there. And I am so happy to make any connections I can make. So as you go through your... Uh, journeys looking for new jobs please don't hesitate to look through everybody i know and if there's somebody that you want to get connected to just ask me i'd be happy to make that connection um and on my website emilyalizamoyer.com pretty easy it's all the same thanks everybody um yay um we will send out a thank you email probably tomorrow with um links to all of where you can find emily where you can find a sweat life and any resources that we mentioned in the presentation we can also include a pdf of the presentation so that you have it with you um, and it was great to see all of you guys on the internet. So cool. All, of you. all right, let's go. Bye guys. Bye.